Hey everyone, so as Will said, my name is Aaron, and I'm going to talk to you guys about paid search. So I'm going to go through some of the best practices and some of the not so best executions that we've seen. So the thing about me is that I love TV. I love TV new and old. I love The Wire. I love Mad Men. I love Breaking Bad. I love Animaniacs. Animaniacs is probably my favorite show of all time. So if you guys haven't seen it before, it's kind of a sketch comedy show. In between, they had these little filler sections. So one of them was called Good Idea, Bad Idea. It was vo uh, voiced by the Motel 6 guy, if you're curious. But, so I'm going to go through 10 good ideas and then 10 really, really bad ideas as it comes to paid search. So first good idea is, surprise, jumping into paid search. It's awesome. Google has a kabillion case studies as to why it's good for your business, it can make you a lot of money. But a really bad idea is jumping into paid search without preparing for it. How are you going to measure success when you start paid search? Who's going to answer the phone when you get a ton of new leads? Who's going to send emails to follow up with those new leads? If you're in e-commerce, how much stuff do you have? We've had clients that ran out of stuff pretty soon after we started up. And you know, does your site work? Can your site handle double, triple, quadruple traffic? You're paying for every single visitor that comes to your site in paid search, so you better be able to do something with them. So once you get them to the site, you got to be able to track what they do. So Google and most of the other engines have these handy little conversion codes that will let you track everything that people do. You can track what they're worth. You can track what their cart total is. It's all right in the engines. You don't have to spend any more money. But what we see a lot is that people are really interested in tracking conversions that just don't matter. So the conversion pixels for AdWords let you track things in two different ways. You can track one per click, which, surprise, it's one person. So it counts the total number of unique converters. You'd want to use this when it's really only worth if you get that person's information one time. If someone goes to your website and fills out a Contact Us form, downloads a white paper, and watches a demo, they still only gave you one email address, so they're only worth it once. You can also look at many per click. And basically what this means is it counts the total number of conversions. So every time someone hits this pixel, that's what it counts. So you should use many per click any time that you're getting money from each conversion. So if I have a store and someone orders shoes, socks, a belt, all different times, that all gives me dollars, so that makes me happy. So basically, when you're starting paid search and really anything digital, you just want to make sure that you focus on what actually makes you money, what makes your business bigger, what makes your business better, what buys you a nicer car, all that stuff. So once you've figured out what the success metrics are, you want to pick keywords. So we're not going to pick the exact phrases that everyone's going to search. Google lets us pick match types. So you can pick a pretty broad keyword and, and use it to research. You'll get data on what people search and what they do. The problem is that sometimes we see people using really broad keywords. So this little slide is just kind of an interpretation of some of the stuff that we've seen in the past. We've seen people bidding on the word buildings. We have seen people bidding on pens. We've seen people bidding on prescriptions. We've seen people bidding on jobs, which, surprise, was not actually Apple. We've seen people bidding on glasses, again, for an eyeglasses site, not a beer glass. So you really have to think of how people search. Do you just want people to get to your website, or you want people to get to your website that's actually going to do something and make you money? So after you have your keywords picked, you have to get ad copy. So you want to write ad copy that has value propositions. Every search is a question asking, why should I do X? People are looking for something, so give them an answer, tell them what to do, and tell them why. Bad idea that we see pretty often is people using value propositions where they don't win. So. Uh, we can kind of read that. So I just got a shiny new laptop. It's over there. I need Microsoft Office. So I search buy Microsoft Office. I can pay $99, $89, or $99. Which one are you going to pick? You're going to pick the one that is the cheapest dollars. So why would those other people waste space saying that they're more expensive? We're always hiring at Sierra. We're always looking for top talent. So say we search where can we post a job? We can go for. 70 million, 20 million, or 5 million? Why would the person who can reach 5 million job seekers say that? They have really, really limited space in the paid search space. You have 70 characters, so don't waste space. You've got to make sure that you put your best foot forward and say something that really matters to the user.
So we got everything turned on. So I'm sure all of you know that AdWords is auction based. So you can adjust your bids at all times. You definitely want to test bids. Um, if you guys are curious about it, this is Hal Varian, Google's chief economist, who is way, way smarter than probably any of us. So he has this crazy video where he goes through the incremental value of a click and all that jazz. It's, it's worth watching. Um, it'll make you want to learn more. What we find a lot is that people always just want to be number one. So why is that a bad idea? Because it's really, really, really expensive. You should always bid what you can afford. You shouldn't bid for position. You shouldn't bid to be the top guy. You should bid what's going to make you the best return. So after a while, you're going to kind of run out of stuff on Google. Google, you might max out. You might cap out. You've gotten all the people you can. So you definitely want to test other engines. Bing and Yahoo are the obvious ones from an advertiser perspective. They're one and the same for us. You manage them through the, the same thing. It's called Ad Center. It's listed there as Microsoft Advertising. There's a ton of other ones across the world that are all great places to get free traffic. These guys know what's what. They know that everyone's going to focus on Google first. So in most cases, you can just download your account and upload it to the other ones. But a really bad idea is just kind of cloning them without actually looking. So this is a little glitch that we found in Bing. Um, Google just released this feature that adds a little plus sign before your keywords as a, as a modifier. The problem is when you download that, it throws an error in Excel. Excel doesn't know what it's called, so it shows up as question mark, name, hashtag. So I just did a quick search on Bing and found that Bonobos, uh, Beaver Creek Stables, and Diapers.com are all bidding on essentially the word name. I probably don't want to do that. Um, so Crystal's going to talk a little bit about phones later, but testing tablets, they're essentially the same thing as a computer, aside from the fact that you do it when you're laying on a couch and watching TV. And it's really easy to set up within AdWords, um, even within Ad Center. It's just a quick little checkbox. You can get kind of ridiculous if you want and pick out, I want to target people with iPad 2s that are searching at 6 o'clock. You can do whatever you want. And it's definitely worth testing because performance is a lot like a computer in most cases. The problem is that you have to make sure that your site looks how you think it does on a tablet. So everyone knows what the fiasco is with iPads, that Flash doesn't really work. So I was doing some browsing in the high fashion space um, and found that Chanel has an all flash site. It doesn't actually show anything. It just shows a thing. It shows a little bullet that says, flash doesn't work. Sorry, can't go home. So that definitely wouldn't be worth testing. Again, more high fashion. I was looking at Fendi. So Fendi pulls in a site, but it doesn't pull in their regular site. This is their mobile site. So it might look fine on a little two-inch phone screen, but it looks horrible on a big, shiny iPad screen. So obviously not all of us have all these tablets laying around, so there are a ton of tools. I have a link, one, link to one here called ScreenFly, so you can see how your site looks in different tablet platforms. You should definitely do that before you consider moving on to tablets. So one of the most important things, you know, you can do all this different stuff to get all different people to your site. But the paid search audience has a notoriously short attention span. So you want to give them a nice brief landing page with a couple quick hit points. And if they want to read more, they should be able to read more. So I was doing a little bit of searching around, and I found this, um, this landing page for Help Scout. And it's a beautiful landing page. It has a bright green button with a call to action. It has a little video to watch. If you look below, you don't have to read those, but all those tabs have different content. And even each of the tabs has different little bullets that mean something. So this is an awesome landing page that people can get what they want pretty quickly. Something bad is writing an essay in your landing page. So you definitely want to give people a lot of content. You want to, you want to tell them what's what, and you want to give them reason to buy from you. But again, short attention span. So this service is called Taxi, which is actually not for taxis, as I came to find out. It's for A&R representation. So if you're a struggling musician, you give them songs, they send them to everyone, you become famous. So you can already look at this site and see that there's a lot of stuff on there. It's only about the top 10% of the site. So all of these things, obviously they wouldn't fit on a single slide, but broken up, that's one landing page. Why would you waste your time writing something that's that long that nobody's going to read? So I came up with a little test for landing pages, which some people may agree with, some may not. Um, but I call it the spin test. So Click on your landing page or your competitor's landing page, spin around in your chair two or three times, 
And if you didn't see what the landing page was about, it probably won't work. Because that two or three seconds is really all that you have to get people's attention before they, they decide the site's not for them. And you really, really, really just don't do that. That happens a lot. So when you add, when you, when you sign up for Google um, and you turn on tagging, they add that little question mark thing at the end, G's, clear ID, and all that junk. That can break landing pages sometimes. So definitely make sure to test your landing pages at least once or twice to make sure that they exist. After you, you're kind of missing people, you can retarget them. I'm sure you guys have been followed around by, well, I need a raise. Um, you, can, you get followed around by, by stuff that you look at online. So these ads, they're great. They're a great way to capture conversions that you didn't get otherwise. But I'm sure a lot of you are really, really, really annoyed by them. So the example that I'll use is Ally. So I opened an account a couple of weeks ago just to store my money. Um, I log in every couple of weeks. I log in pretty frequently. I'm pretty good about that stuff. But they kind of keep on, they don't stop. And it's not restricted to just sort of other clients. People in the industry do it too. Google annoys us nonstop. Um, probably makes sense because they don't have to pay for it. But advertise.com, one of those little guys, have the creepiest remarketing ad ever. So you can use things called burn codes, which basically strips people out of the audience. So you want to put a burn code on your current customers. Throw it on your login page. Throw it on your confirmation page. Get rid of these people so you're not wasting your money on people that aren't going to give you more money. And also, they have this tool called impression caps. So you might see the same ad over and over and over again. It gets really, really annoying. You can set the amount of times that people will see an individual ad. And please, please do. So number 10, after you've got all, of the, all this money from search and all this money from display, you want to test social. It's a great idea for a lot of brands. It, apparently, a great idea for Flo, the insurance lady. But it's a really bad idea just testing it because it's there. So, as a company, what's a like worth to you? Follower, Google pluses? What are you going to do with these people when you get them? If you don't have a plan for dealing with them afterwards, that's probably not the metric you should be going for. You can obviously target these people going back to your site, but again, depends if it works for you guys. So to wrap it up, the best idea with paid search is test, analyze, retest, reanalyze, retest, and yeah so on and so forth. We get data on everything that happens, so why wouldn't you keep using it? The obvious bad idea is not. A lot of times we see paid search being executed in kind of a set it and forget it kind of way. You can look through change history in AdWords and see if people have done stuff. We've seen accounts that haven't been touched in a year. Again, this is all data that we have that can be used at all times. So I hope these tips helped you guys out. Um, obviously, we'll be around, and Crystal will be talking about mobile next. <laughs>